Our sponsors are Esteban, NTY Property, Lyric Lane, Refos, Clinicare Chemist near McDonald's, Rabble Books, and uh, uh, Mayland Shopping Centre, and Mustengo Wines. So if you do visit any of those places, for those people that hang around Maylands, um, please thank them for their support. Um, the funding we receive from them, um, from our members and our sponsors, are what allow us to keep running. So again, thank you to all of those people. Now, to tonight's talk. Let me give you a brief introduction of Keith Cundell, whom I know quite well, <laughs> and because I'm his wife, for those that didn't know. Um, and you will see why he has chosen to research and present the subject of tonight's talk the changing faces of Maylands. Keith and I left the UK um, in 1991 with two very young daughters. Since then, we've lived in South Africa, Indonesia, Thailand, Bangladesh, and Malawi, before settling in Maylands in 2016, having previously had some years up in Darlington in the hills. On top of that, Keith has had to travel a lot. <laughs> He's worked in around a dozen European countries, about a dozen African countries, and even more Asian countries. Um, so you can see that we've had a lot of our lives over the past 32 years have been spent as immigrants, um, as strangers in another land, in another's land, with the inevitable differences in language, food, customs, culture. So it was from this background, and realizing that Maylands itself is very culturally diverse, um, that, Keith, that led Keith to researching this talk tonight. Research that he's found fascinating, I've been hearing some of the stories too, and I hope you find it fascinating as well. So without further ado, let me introduce Keith. <laughs> Thank you, Sue. Uh, just before I start, I'd just like to acknowledge that we've got some nice, some interesting visitors who've come to join us today. I'm delighted to have met Father Ihor Halovko from the Ukrainian Catholic Church. We'll be talking about him a little later. And I'm pleased and honoured that the, the Mayor of Bayswater, Councillor Philomena Pifferetti, has come, and our Southwall Councillor, Councillor Catherine Earhart. I'm also delighted that at least the daughter of at least one of the people that we're talking about tonight is here tonight. I'll talk a little bit more about Silvana later. If anyone else is here as a relative and hasn't introduced themselves because I was busy next door doing some last minute adjustments, my apologies, put your hand up a bit later and I believe there are some people here who've got some interesting stories. It is indeed true that although I don't speak many, if any, of the many, many different languages in the diverse countries we've lived in, I have become used to working amongst different cultures and I, I was intrigued to find out more about how newcomers to our location coped with coming to a new country. And so tonight's talk is about the changing faces of Maylands. It's just a brief look at how the population of Maylands has grown, how it's changed and what the current composition is. Maylands, for those of you who don't know, and those of you who do know, has many different facets to living in Maylands. <laughs> do we talk about the tranquility of the Swan River down on the peninsula? Do we have, we have the reminders of our history? Tranby House, Peninsula Farm. And there's the built heritage, the heritage we have around us, and the old buildings around 8th Avenue, Watley, and so on. And indeed this building, a heritage building. It's from the greenery of the foreshore to the gritty urban business centre that gives us the, the variety in our, our suburb. And of course, oh, sorry, Maylands has many different faces. And these are the faces of some of the people we'll be talking about tonight. And there'll be a competition at the end to see how many of them you remember. But before I move on, I want to just expand on the acknowledgement of country that Sue just gave us. Although there's no written records and the physical evidence is hard to understand and discover and to interpret, the Wajuk people have used the Swan River, Durbal Yerrigan, for many, many years. 
We know that they lived and camped and hunted and passed through, but I don't know enough yet to be able to tell their stories in a way that's truthful, complete and respectful. This is an area of learning that I'm keen to pursue in years to come, but I do acknowledge that there's a huge gap in what we're doing, talking about. We all know the story of the Tranby, the first European settlers coming here in the 1829-1830. But I wonder how many of you have heard of this gentleman, the story of Mudassa, a cameleer turned market gardener. This is one of the stories that John told me many years ago, and I was always interested in it. Mudassa Baradin was born in what's now Pakistan, in Karachi, in 1868. This was a place of violence, rebellion and poverty. But in a distant part of the world, here in Australia, there was a demand for some particular skills. As the gold fields opened up, as, a, as, a, as the interior of the country opened up, they found that horses and bullocks weren't really suitable for the harsh and dry conditions. And so they decided to import camels. But of course, we didn't have many camel drivers. And so Mohammed and his brother, Madassa and his brother Mohammed, came over in the early 1900s to work as camel drivers. They came to Outback Australia and joined the group of camel train drivers that were colloquially and rather inaccurately known as the Afghans, hence the Ghan train and so on, but they weren't in fact from Afghanistan. A series of adventures and misadventures followed, including a short period of, in jail when they stole a horse, but they became, became organised and settled down. Records from this place and time are scant. At that time, Europeans were well documented. People knew births, marriages, deaths, and so on. The indigenous people weren't considered important enough to count or to record. And foreigners like the Afghans, or the, this guy from Pakistan, as it is now, often fell between the cracks. Language problems, cultural problems. It's hard to find some of the records. But John did a lot of digging and he found some of the evidence to tell the story. But when Mohammed died, his brother took on the cultural obligation to marry his wife, the widow. And this was a special lady who took on the religion of her future husband, raised the families of two brothers, ran a horticultural business in the absence of her husband, and kept everything together during difficult times. The point of this story is this family moved to Maylands in 1915, and Madassa took over an established market garden Anybody know where that was? Kirkham Hill Terrace at the bottom, where Baringa Park. So one of the market gardens at the bottom of Kirkham Hill Terrace. So two poor refugees from what's now Pakistan came to live in the desolate outback of Western Australia, worked hard at their jobs, and eventually settled down in Maylands. So one of the first of our far distant immigrants. Some years later, the development of industry, initially alongside the railway line and in the streets nearby, led to a great influx of people. No apologies for using these pictures. I've used them before on my railway talk, but I love the pictures of these great trains steaming through where the factories are built along Watley Crescent. And I particularly like this one, the fact that the trains used to drive across Watley Crescent. I think it's fascinating. They were shunted into the, um, the Ferguson works. And where people came, they needed houses, as we all know. Housing grew around the suburb to cater for these new workers. And these are some of the adverts that appeared early on, advertising mainlands as a great place to live, the gold estates of Australia, advertising this new speculative development, encouraging people to come and live in mainlands. So the workers came to the factories, the houses built, population grew. Maylands is a portion of the Swan location near Mepham Ferguson's foundry, so quite convenient. If you happen to work in the foundry, come and live here. The magnificent estate in Maylands. This is going from Railway Crescent down there. I don't know how it reached the, the river, I'm not quite sure. So, house building boom followed. Working class area became more and more occupied. And where are we now? Well, it's interesting when you look, start looking at the numbers. Of course, we are part of the city of Bayswater, obviously. But we're also part of the parliamentary electorate of Maylands, which is rather larger. So 
when I was researching population numbers, I had to make sure I was doing the right numbers. Immigration has changed over time. Before 1941, the country from which most new arrivals came from was the UK, followed somewhat behind by Italy, and then there are a number of other countries with quite small numbers. Interestingly enough, England, or UK, is often referred to in some of the statistics as England, but I'm taking this to be the UK, including Scotland and everywhere else. In the war years, and up to 1950, suddenly there's more of an influx from the countries clearly affected by the war. Germany, Poland, Italy. 1951 to 60, Italy was the most largest single group of people coming into the, into the, um, into the suburb. But then Holland appears, and Germany and Greece then. And there are lots of other countries, but very small numbers. You need to remember that up until 1973, there were restrictions on the immigration of people from outside the Caucasian states. The Immigration Restriction Act of 1901, pejoratively called the White Australia Policy. So clearly there were going to be no immigrants from these other countries because they weren't allowed to settle. Therefore, in the 1960s, you see the fact that the first significant numbers of people from the Indian subcontinent arrived, and also from New Zealand. 1970 to 1980, New Zealand crept up, and for the first time we see significant numbers of people from Vietnam and Malaysia. Vietnam crept up during the 1980s, Malaysia, and also a number of people coming in from Poland. And then by the 1990s, China and Hong Kong and Macau, the SARs, were also appearing in the top five. So the same one all the way through, apart from period in the 1950s, the UK was the most populous one, um, and then the European countries, with maybe some of the Asian ones. And by the most recent numbers, taking us up to 2005, we find that China was the second most populous group, followed by India. These numbers analyze where people came from, but it must be remembered that these, are only a, these other numbers are only a small percentage of the total population. The data from the 1921, 2021, sorry, shows that of the people in, that we recorded and that gave their country of birth, 7,400 came from Australia, representing 56% of the population of mainland. Were, gave their country of birth as Australia. UK at 5.8, India 4%, New Zealand 2.1, Malaysia and Vietnam. So that's okay, so the majority of people came from, were born in Australia. Interestingly, I don't know if you can read these numbers, Australia-wide was nearly 67%, but 56, so a somewhat lower percentage of people in mainlands were actually born in Australia. Whereas, if you look at um, Malaysia, 1.4 against 0.7, small percentages, but double the percentage of people born in Malaysia lived in mainlands compared with the rest of WA and Australia. So I think that begins to build a pattern of this multicultural uh, diversity. And if you look at the country of birth of the parents, 48% or 49% of the people in mainlands had both parents born overseas, whereas in Australia it's only 37% overall. So many more had parents born overseas. Both parents born in Australia, 30% in, Aust in Malaysia, had, in mainlands, had both parents born in Australia, but overall across Australia, nearly 46%. So again, emphasising that mul the melting pot that is mainlands today, based on these patterns of immigration, It's actually official that we are a richly diverse suburb. This is taken off the web page, the website of Mainland Peninsula Primary School. Richly diverse socio-economic. 19% of the students were born in 40 overseas countries. So you've got a, in the children coming up through the school system are growing up in a very diverse environment. 51% of the students speak a language other than English. And it, it 
with 69 other languages. And they offer English as an additional subject to help the kids who are moving into the neighborhood who don't have the language. Okay, enough nerdy analysis. Let's talk about people. I just want to share some of the stories that were shared with me about people who come from Holland, from Taiwan, from other Ukraine, from other places. And also mention some of the refugees who've come here from many different places. Anecdotally, I knew that people came from many different places. I saw the range of faces at my own citizenship ceremony a few years ago. And we can see on the streets that other people have different characteristics of our own. Where do they come from? What's their story? Why did they come? How did they settle in there? And so when I went to, started off doing this, I started talking to people, people in the historical society, local businesses, people I knew who'd lived here for a while, and said, can you give me any names of people I can talk to? And I came up with this great long list of people I can talk to. So I did as many people as I could in the time available. And for those I haven't used, I shall come back to talking about them later. So what are some of these stories? The first one's Hetty Veron. This is a story of a Belgian girl born in 1930 who moved to Holland as a young girl who had a happy childhood until the horrors of the Second World War and occupation transformed her life and resulted in the loss and death of so many of her family. She survived this dreadful period and eventually became one of the more successful migrants to Australia. She lives amongst us still and she's even given a talk here for the Historical Association. So she was born in 1930 in Antwerp, and this is a picture of Hetty with her brothers, Max and Jackie. Happy childhood, her father was quite well to do. He was a Jewish businessman. Things were good for the family, but they got worse and worse, of course, during the war and during occupation. And gradually it became harder and harder for them in Amsterdam, in Antwerp, and sorry, in Amsterdam they moved to. And by 1943, the Verkendam family were rounded up one of the many Jewish families are rounded up and taken by train to Bergen-Belsen concentration camp. At only 13, Hetty's life was changed completely. And so from then on, she was incarcerated in a concentration camp for something over a year. Forty children were held in Barrack 211, which became known as the Children's House. So Belsen was here, they, they'd been taken away from the Netherlands and taken over to Bergen-Belsen. For the next 14 months she was interned there. Whilst this was, this was not one of the extermination camps, those were places like Auschwitz and places like that, a huge number of people died, unimaginable deprivation, starvation and back mistreatment. Hetty was installed in the part of the camp known as the Children's House, a series of huts where 40 children ranging in age from 3 to 14 were imprisoned. Her life there was undeniably hard, although there were some kind-hearted adults who tried to do their best for the children. Hetty's story is told in this book, which I will talk, tell you about later, but she's written a book about it called The Children's House and recounts those period of her life when she was in there. It's, it's not exactly an easy read. It's distressing and upsetting in many ways, but it's inspiring to see how the human spirit can triumph under the most appalling conditions. So many of the family and friends that Hetty had back in Holland were shipped off to the death camps. School friends, uncles, aunts. Fortunately, her parents survived. And I think they, had, as I can't remember the details, but they did survive the war. But grandparents were all taken away by train to be gassed or to be killed in some other way. Her parents somehow survived the war and she was reunited with them in 1945. 1945 saw the liberation of the camps. The British were coming in from the west. This is a, um, a memorial that was erected at the site. 10,000 unburied dead were found here and another 13,000 have since died. It's too easy if you do a search for Bergen-Belsen. The most appalling pictures come up, which are probably not appropriate to share. But these were people who just died through malnutrition, through neglect, rather than extermination itself. And this is a memorial, a present memorial. There's nothing left, of course, but there's a memorial for the people who died. 
After the war, Hetty returned to Holland with her siblings. In 1954, she was able to make my grace to Australia. This is her with her brothers before they left, and her friend. This is her two brothers and a friend. In 1954, she arrived in Sydney, following her brother Max, who'd come here a little bit before, in 1951, and her parents were already living in Sydney. She stayed there for 10 years, working in a number of jobs to get herself established. Later, she moved to Adelaide and continued to expand her business activity, including in real estate. But she decided she wanted to be part of the whole hype around the Ameri America's Cup, and so she came to Perth in the 1980s. She built an estate agency here, and her first home was on 9th Avenue in Mainland, and then she moved into Peninsula Road, where she's been ever since. She had a block, she sold the back, she now lives in the back block, where we went around to see her house. In common with many people of that era, Hetty's mum gave birth to her eldest child quite young, at only 18 years old, and in turn Hetty herself had a daughter just before her 22nd birthday. Her grandson is now a scientist and his wife had recently had a child, thus Hetty is now a proud great-grandmother. She's had many awards given to her and she does a lot of work for charity, and many of you, I'm sure, will have seen her around the place. She's still a very, very compost mentis at 93, and I was going around there sorting things out. She was ordering me around, wasn't she? Move those boxes, pick up that box. So she's still very, very compost mentis. She has sent some books along for sale. They are $20 each, and all the proceeds go to her charity called the Children, the Children of Belson Trust. So you're welcome to have a look at it, and if you want to buy it, please talk to Angela or Sue about it afterwards. Oh, no, there should be another battery. Too. There's an extension lead in this bag here. Sorry, you said it had three hours, but... Sorry. Extension lead. Yep. Into... Into the computer. Sorry about that. Technology is wonderful. Yeah. So there's Hetty from Holland through, through a concentration camp and now living in Mainland. From the other side of the world, a lady I met called Pai Ching. She was born in 1971 in Taichung, the second largest city in Taiwan, located, as you can see, in the centre. Taiwan, of course, has been, and China would still consider it to be part of China, but it is officially an independent country. Very built up area. Her parents worked as public servants and with one brother and one sister she had a comfortable life in Taiwan. She studied Western languages and literature at university and she worked as an English teacher and through her work met an Australian man. In her mid-twenties, Pai Ching felt that her sense of adventure was leading her to make some important life choices and she decided to move to Australia to be with her long-distance boyfriend. Right, this is her growing up. This is Pai Chin when she was about three or four. And this is her mother. This was where her father worked in the public offices. This is a picture of her dad. He sadly died a few years ago. But there he was, holding the hand of his daughter. In the 1990s, she moved to Bayswater, where she lived with her husband. Sadly, the marriage didn't last. But in 2005, she moved to, with her daughter to Maylands. When she first landed in Australia, she felt somewhat isolated. And she said to me, I didn't see too many Asian faces around. But thankfully, she was able to join the, the temple, which we all know. And she's had a valuable support from the members in the temple. Clearly, the Buddhist religion that she brought from Taiwan and... A, a, at the heart of Buddhist tradition is a respect for others and a desire to be kind and to show mindfulness towards people you meet. This attitude and belief within the temple community was one of the main things that helped Pai Ching to settle down in, in mainland. She's been a regular attendee at that temple ever since. Indeed, now she helps to lead some of the meditation sessions on a Saturday. 
Tai Ching understandably felt a little isolated at first with no family and few other East Asians around, let alone Taiwanese. But through her support at the temple, she's become thoroughly settled here. She soon found, realized, however, that us mainlanders found her birth name, Pai Ching, hard to remember and use. And so she decided to adopt the word name Sophia. But in true Australian traditions, even that's a bit complicated, so she called herself Sophie. So she now refers to herself as Sophie Lee, unless you want to call her proper birth name. This is a Taiwanese bride when she was, although over here, but she was in her Taiwanese. The birth of her daughter. Her daughter's now fully Australianized. She's qualified. She went to uh, Murdoch University to study vet science, and she's now working as a vet in a clinic. Sophie's happily settled here now, although, as I said, she found it a little daunting at first. She soon fell in love with the place, and who wouldn't? She, lo- she now sees lots of other different faces around. She's got lots of friends in the Buddhist temple and she feels it's a great place to live. Her neighborhood, she only lives just along railway parade from here, is convenient and friendly, and she loves the buzz that's around mainland today. And nowadays she sees lots of young people, different nationalities, lots of opportunities to try different foods and cultures. I think it's really good actually that I I met uh, Pai Ching over at Watley's on um, Chapels on Watley. Uh, which she likes, it's her local favourite because she knows all about the different teas and any of you who've been in there know about the architecture with all the wood and she said it reminds her so much of her grandfather's house back in Taiwan which I thought was quite cute so that's one of the reasons she's really comfortable in mainland, she goes back to Taiwan occasionally and she put volunteering at the temple giving something back to the community working in various places as a volunteer she's really developed her life and really feels at home in mainland. This is a story of a long distance romance. Some of you may have seen it advertised in the paper, and it's about Maria Tortoriello, and I'll find out, is that okay? Tortoriello, who was born 88 years ago in a small village towards the south of, of Italy. It's a story of a young girl and a young man from northern part of the country introduced by her brother, who eventually married and lived happily in Maylands for many, many years. She was one of nine children born into a poor but respectable working family. In the 1950s, her elder brother, Carmine, left Australia, left their home in Picerno to to make a new life in Australia. Along the way, he met a guy called Ottorino Capi, who had arrived in Fremantle in 1952. They became firm friends, and when, and when some time later, sorry, Ottorino settled down and decided he wanted to find a wife. Carmi knew just the person for him. He had four sisters, so he had a, Otto had quite a good choice. <laughs> Maria and Otto started a long-term distance relationship, and it's fascinating to hear about this. So they started corresponding and maintained it and deepened it over the years. It's hard enough now with instant messaging. Can you imagine writing a letter? Dearest one, how are you? Putting on the boat, two months over there, two months, but I'm fine, how are you? And so on. But they managed to develop this relationship and it deepened and deepened over the years. And married by proxy, and if anyone's interested, Silvana may be able to explain the technology and the technical implications, but they're actually married on different sides of the world, by proxy in 1955. And she came to to Australia at the turn of the year in 1956. Whatever the barriers were, their friendship developed, and she agreed to come out to Australia, having married him after a 23-day journey in Orion. This is a wonderful picture taken after they got together, of course, not on their wedding day. This is when she arrived in Australia. Maria joined her husband, as I said, in Australia in 1956. This is a picture of Maria and Otto. This is her brother and his wife shortly after they'd arrived. They settle in a house in Elizabeth Street, and Maria still lives in that street and in the house next door. So she hasn't moved far in all those years since she came to mainland. And this was the birth of one of their children. So she certainly settled down. She had no English when she arrived, and had to teach herself the language, 
while also working to earn money to look for their life together. Neither parent had a license to drive in Australia and were reliant on others to help them settle in. Luckily, they made good friends with their neighbours here in Maylands and Silvana and her siblings grew up with lots of honorary uncles and aunties who lived around them. With the support of these new friends and neighbours, the Cappies became well established in the locality. Maria, in particular, was very keen for her children to have the sort of education that she'd not been able to acquire herself. As a girl from a small village in Italy, she hadn't had that opportunity. And so she was justifiably pleased and proud of the progress and success of her children in their chosen careers, and also grateful that her son is willing and able to help her to continue to live in the family home, despite the increasing frailty of being in her late 80s. They had five children, four of whom are still living, and after 40 years of marriage, they renewed their vows, and there's a lovely photograph taken on their 40th wedding anniversary. Sadly, Otto passed away in 2006, where they had a long and happy marriage. I've said this, that she was happy to stay. Interesting enough, I mean, imagine the, the size of that decision to move across the, the world to marry somebody or to go to somebody you haven't actually really met. A really adventurous and brave decision for a late young girl in her 20s. But it seems that once she got here, she was happy to stay. She had no real sense of rushing, needing to rush back. Although Silvana's taken her to Europe and Canada, she didn't go back in 85. But hey, she's got a large family around her. All the family come to see her, and she's really happily settled. Silvana herself has worked for many years as a social worker, and although she lives in Willerton, is a frequent visitor to Maylands and to help with the caring of her mother. And I'm delighted that she's come here with us today. What about Angela Dyer? If anyone who knows who Angela Dyer is, one of the ten pound poms. Now I thought that the expression ten pound pom was an insult dreamed up by the Aussie cricket fans to diss the old enemy. <laughs> but apparently I actually met this lady who proudly claimed, she didn't admit it, she claimed and proudly said that to be one of the ten pound poms. And I'd like to share the story of how she came with nothing as made her life for herself here. Angela was born and lived most of her life in the centre of England, around Leamington Spa, Birmingham, and around the Midlands. And here's a picture of a proud bridesmaid, six years old, in Solihull, going to her cousin's wedding. Anyone who recognises her point to her, she is here tonight. She lived in a very agricultural region. Her father was a farm manager, and her early life was spent in and around the area. And she went, as many of her compatriots would do, to an agricultural college. Now, this didn't really resonate with, with Angela, and so she left to look at other options, including bar work and working in various jobs, including Rackham's, which was part of the Harrods Empire. And later she went to North Wales. Although she had a good job and she was doing well, it wasn't enough to keep her... Oh, sorry, this is from where her mother shop... Um, and I have to be reminded what her mother's shop used to be. But it's now an Indian outfitter's, and you can see from the Indian... Um, science. This is now a very, even more culturally diverse area of Birmingham than we have here. Interesting, I looked it on the map, it's only a short walk from the central mosque in Birmingham, and even more importantly, it's only a 30-minute walk from Edgebaston Cricket Ground, where the cricket's going at this very moment, so a very, a very important part of Birmingham. And pictures of Angela when she was younger, with one of her pets. And this is Angela, and these are two cows at the Warwickshire Royal Show. But although she had a good life in her teens, it wasn't enough really for an adventurous girl who wanted to spread her wings. This is a young woman who wanted to see more of the world. And she, dis she made the decision to emigrate, and at that time her choices were Canada, which is far too cold. South Africa wasn't so encouraging for white people perhaps at that time. Australia, why not? So take the plunge in, the early, in her 20s and travel to the land done under. In 1970, she got on the steamship Fairstar and took the assisted passage, the 10-pound pond passage to Fremantle, calling Las Palmas and Cape Town 
At that time, it was a regular service line and later became a cruise ship and a bit of a party ship, I understand. And lots of parties went on on Fairstar, and she, she can tell you all about these later if you want to know. Now look, Angela had no plans when she came here. She just thought, I'm going to start a new life. I'm going to go over there. And none of the government scheme at that time, they were given one night's accommodation in a hotel and then said, on your own, you can do it. Hence, I suppose, the £10 bit. Luckily, she had some friends who were already living in Perth, but, and they were able to meet her and take her to the hotel. She arrived in Fremantle with £100 in her wallet, and that's everything she had in the world. She was met by her friends who took her to the Britannia Hotel in central Perth. New arrivals, as I said, were allowed one night's accommodation. Amazingly, and luckily for Angela, or perhaps she just worked hard, she was able to find a job within a day or two, calling in at some of the classier city centre Center, city center hotels and explaining her sh skills and experience. One of the first places she went to work was the Parmelia. Anybody remember the Parmelia before? It, apparently it's gone downhill now it's the Hilton, but in that case it was a good place to go. Amazingly, from today's perspective, she was also able to find a room within a couple of days to rent in Mount Street for £9 a week with views over the city and an easy walk to the city centre where she worked. While she was working, she became a very successful mixologist. <laughs> She's actually a real cocktail expert and to the extent of, this is in a booklet issued by the Parmelia to um, recognise the first 10 years, and this is when she entered the competition, won the local heat but apparently it wasn't good for the ladies to go over to Sydney for the finals, so she was given a ladies' prize, which seems a bit of a swizz. But her recipe later went on to win a prize. Angela's success in hospitality led to a number of different jobs around, and she began to settle down in her adopted country. She was able to bring her mother over at the age of 69 and settle her in Kathleen Avenue. Her mother lived on in Maylands until she was 93 years old. Along the way, Angela Dyer met and married a Greek Cypriot man who was also involved in running hospitality venues and then, of course, changed her name to Lucades and kept on her name even after they'd separated because of her son. With a single son, with a single child, Angela's continued her pattern of being an only child of an only child. And now she has just one child. These are three generations together. This is Angela her mother or granny, and her son Paul. In the time, Angela settled down and um, developed a number of other interests. Any of you who've been to the old police station over the last few years will recognise this picture, wonderful picture of Angela doing her tapestry, and she's entered the tapestry, and this was in the Perth Now newspaper back in 2015. For many years, she's entered and won prizes at the Perth Royal Show. And now she does a lot of volunteering. She's worked for 14 years at the Art Gallery. She's on the Resident and Rate Pairs Association. She's worked in the school canteen. And most importantly, we're continually grateful that she keeps in contact with our sponsors and helps to deliver our flyers and newsletters every month she goes around. As part of her job, she pounds the streets delivering things and she helps us. So an ambitious young girl from the English Midlands took the plunge, travelled across the world as a £10 pom, found her feet in Perth, and built a successful life in our suburb. And back to Turkey, Doruk Kayan. The story of a man who came to Australia from Turkey with his family, later went back to Turkey, came back to study, went to the UK to work as a business executive, and is now running one of Mayland's iconic businesses. This is Doruk's story. He was born in Ankara in Turkey in 1980, and his father, Turgot was in charge of the customs department at the main international airport in Istanbul and his mother was also in aviation as an aviation officer. At that time, neither parent had any plans to emigrate. His father had a very good middle class job in the airport and they were happy there. But a series of interesting events led Turgot to being invited to visit Australia. Apparently the story goes that there was, he was in charge of customs and there was a kerfuffle one day and there was this guy at customs who was having trouble trying to bring something in or he was getting stopped for something. If you've ever seen Border Patrol, you know the sort of things that go on. 
Anyway, Turgut came down and sorted this guy out, and he was so grateful that he'd sorted out his problem. He said to him, if you ever want to come to Australia, I can help you. So he said, yeah, 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 you know how people talk like that. Anyway, a few months later, he got an official invitation from the consul to visit Australia with a view to becoming an emigrant. And so they moved over there, and, and he came over here, made the decision to stay, and settled in mainland as soon as they had their visa. At the time that they came over, Dura, you got his name there, just be, he was only four, just before he left Turkey to come to Australia. <clears throat> Although at the time he came, he couldn't get a job at the same level as he'd had in Istanbul, he was willing to work hard, Duruk's, Duruk's father, and he worked in the local factories and offices. He was doing well. And his family was setting up. I apologise, this was the photograph I was trying to have problems, I had problems with just before we came on. This is adopting the Australian system of playing cricket in the backyard and his first day at school, proudly carrying his school bag. So there they were, happy in, in Mayland. But his father decided that they, wanted to, they should make a move back to Turkey. So in 1990, the family moved back and Durak had to learn his original native language again after so many years in Australia. So having grown up in school, he then had to go back to Turkey and learn his Turkish. He stayed in Turkey until he was 18 years old, and then he came back to Perth to study business studies at Curtin. So that's his younger brother, Hazar, adjusting to life back in Turkey. So having settled down to the Aussie way of life, they had to go back to Turkey. He came back to study at Curtin, where he did business studies, and then with his, with his degrees after graduation, he found a job in Leicester in the English Midlands, and worked as an executive in the power industry. Work was going well for Doric, he was, he was happy there. But in the meantime, his brother had been in management for many years and was looking for a change of lifestyle. He saw an opportunity in retail hospitality back here in Australia and convinced Doric to join him here in his new venture. They came back to Mayland in 2014 and took over the well-established Refos Cafe on the corner of Guildford Road and 8th Avenue. Dorok's brother left Refos a couple of years ago and now runs a cafe and restaurant in Beaufort Street. So Dorok has been running Refos since. Coming here at such an early age with his family meant that Dorok was able to find his feet whilst moving through the classes. And obviously his later studies helped to reinforce that sense of belonging. His impressions of Maylands have always been very positive. The sense of community that exists and the strong feeling of living in a vibrant neighbourhood makes life in this suburb very attractive. He's now settled in, well settled. This was the first day of school for his daughter Valentina and Adrian. Durok and his wife have actually separated. His children and wife live in Mayland. Durok actually has an apartment now in the city. Refos, a local landmark, well established. We all go there. Along with many other business owners, he's found the last few years to be tough. Firstly, with the COVID difficulties and now the rapidly increasing costs of doing business. Ideally, he told me, he'd like to see more life and activity in the shops along 8th Avenue. Anyone who's seen how many empty shops there are on 8th Avenue. The more shops, the more cafes, the more restaurants, the better it is for the ones who are there. Although his particular business continues to be popular, I hadn't realised until he told me it's open seven days a week from six in the morning till ten at night. Massive management issues to keep that going. Durak's parents are long retired and they try to spend half their year in Istanbul and the other six months of their life in Victoria Park. So a, man who, a young man who came to Australia at the age four, went back, came back, and is now running one of our core businesses and is also one of our sponsors. Fascinating to talk to him. I said about some of the numbers of people who came from different countries. And I was able to spend some time with Father Ihor, the priest of the Ukrainian Catholic Church of St. John the Baptist, which you all know is up on the hill, Ferguson and Sherwood, that tall church that's right at the top there. I went back to talk to him recently to find out about why Ukrainians came here and why the church building itself is so large. Father Ihor explained that he's a parish priest, just that the parish happens to be the whole of Western Australia. So it's a fair amount of travelling. So with a few churches there, this is the main church for the Catholic Ukrainians 
uh, in, in WA. The first wave of newcomers from that country arrived in the aftermath of World War II, although there were people of Ukrainian descent living here long ago. Father Ehor told me that there are names with Ukrainian heritage that can be found on various Anzac memorials who served in the Anzacs to show that they were living here at the turn of the century. A further wave of Ukrainian Catholic immigrants arrived from Bosnia after President Tito opened the borders of the then Yugoslavia and during the civil war that erupted in the 1990s. Then there came a period where there weren't so many Ukrainians settling here, but recent events of the country have driven more people to flee the terrible events of the Russian invasion and war and to find safety and a new life in Australia. And I was astonished and delighted when Father Eho told me that in fact he has with him a young lady who has actually just arrived as a refugee from Kiev. She's come over for, to flee the war and the dangers and she's now settling, she's living with him in the presbytery in Maylands. There are a number of other Ukrainian families living near the church in the streets around near the Gibney Reserve, although they weren't available for me to talk to at the time of doing this research, but that might be interesting in the future. I was able to take part in, uh, or sit at the back of part of the service, and I was also able to witness a special memorial service uh, in the, in the, by the memorial just outside the church. Interestingly enough, I hadn't seen this flag before. This is symbolising the black, the rich soil of the Ukraine. Great wheat growing. It's a, the breadbasket of Eastern Europe. Very, very um, rich soil and the blood of the Ukrainian people. The church is very supportive of people who come in and they're able to give support to the families and the, they support the education of the children. And one of the important things that came out for me is how important the sorry how important the the, the symbolism, the language, the, the mass itself was was conducted in Ukrainian, and the, the 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 culture, the language, the religion is maintained. And so, although these people are Australian, they're maintaining their Ukrainian identity. We see that in the Polish church. We see that in some of the other churches around, that they're maintaining their culture whilst at the same time being Australian. A very serious looking father there. Somebody else who fleed, fleed poverty, <clears throat> I talked to a guy called Tekle, Tekel. He came from Asmara in Eritrea and some 20, 30 years, 20 years ago. Um, a bit longer, the Eritrean War, where they declared independence from Ethiopia. So from the Horn of Africa, he came to Australia. He came here as an official refugee, and he was allocated a caseworker by the government to, to help him settle in. But he found that, like many of us, the local community was a far more powerful and effective source of help and advice. He initially settled in Maddington, then he went to Mirabuka and it more recently ended up in Mayland. Like 70% of his fellow countrymen who made the journey here, he had no English when he arrived, so the first task he had to do was to learn English. He's created a home for himself, he's got a job, a wife and two children, and has a home in East Street, and a strong network of friends to help them. He and his family attend the church, which is in the, the uh, hall of the... Catholic Church, the Eritrean Orthodox Tawahedo Church on 7th Avenue. And just as the Ukrainians I've just mentioned, the church for these people is a powerful source of help and support, an important part of the Eritrean community, maintaining their religion, culture and language. Have you ever been past there on a Sunday and seen the ladies and the amazing, and I was there on a Sunday and the singing that was coming out, very, very colourful. The impact of COVID meant he hasn't been able to visit friends and family back in Africa for some years. But just recently, with the borders reopening here, he was able to spend an extended time with his family meeting up in Uganda in Eastern Africa. He's tekel, tekel told me that the pandemic and the closure of borders has reduced the flow of refugees considerably. But just recently, with the borders reopening, he's seeing a couple of refugees coming in now from Eritrea and into mainland. 
So there's somebody who fled his homeland to seek a new future for himself, and now he's really happily settled in mainland. Many, many other people have interesting stories to tell. And if we went round the room tonight, I'm sure there'd be another 50 stories to tell. Many other people were suggested to me, but I couldn't interview all of them in the time available to me. People who arrived from Italy, from Austria, somebody from the Seychelles, other people from the Middle East, South Asia and Southeast Asia. And I'm really aware that it's a huge gap in these stories I tried to talk to some people from India. I tried to talk to some people from the Lebanese ca cafe. I was met with some reluctance, suspicion. Maybe when you go in and say, well, can I talk to you about living in Maylands? They might have wondered what it was about. But I'm hoping that in the future, one of our plans is to capture the oral histories of people using the new equipment we're going to buy with our grant and ensure that their stories can be saved and shared. I'd like to meet some of these people from Malaysia from Vietnam, as I said, from the Indian subcontinent, from anywhere from the Middle East, people who attend the Islamic Center above uh, IGA. These people probably have really interesting stories to tell. We need to be able to gain their trust and confidence in order to tell their stories. And that's something that we plan to do in the future and to capture these oral histories so that we can pass, record them and share them with people. Buildings and places also have interesting stories, and we have plans to develop technology that will allow us to share these stories as well. I've already mentioned the Catholic Church, uh, the Polish Church on 8th Avenue, uh, and the old Salvation Army Citadel there. The shops, the Indian food store, the different restaurants we have, the Malay hawker food across from IGA, and I've already mentioned the specialist tea shop that reminded Pai Ching of living in Taiwan. So I'd love to make sure that we collect the facts and figures relating to our heritage buildings so that we can share them and load them onto the website for future generations to share. And one of our objectives is we have some exciting plans for interactive maps, digital maps of Maylands where people can press on a, on a house or a road or something and up comes the information we have. When people say, you haven't got anything on my house, it's a great opportunity. I say, well, sit down and tell us all about it. You do the research, and then we'll load it up there. But this is one of the things we want to do, to start sharing the stories of people, the places, and the buildings. We have the information, lots of information. We need to bring it all together. And, of course, one of the other objectives for me this year, and it was last year, is to be able to learn about and share the Wajak Nunga stories about living on Durbal Yerrigan and how they use the river and what their life was like in Maylands. So that brings us full, full circle, right back to the beginning, the first residents of here. I just, if, do you have any questions? Do you have any stories to share? Is there anything you'd like to share about living in Maylands? Other than that, thank you very much.
always have a road near the corner of East Street. Um, my family came from India in the 1950s, and more of us have been mainlanders most of our life. But our next door neighbour at the time was a gentleman called Mr. Dingle, and um, he had a, a daughter, or it might have been a sister, called Ariel, and she was a Down syndrome lady, but she was sort of full grown, and she also she used to always offer the children lollies through the fence. And she was just a little sweetheart, and I couldn't understand the word she said. But Mr. Dingle, I never got to know his first name. Mm -hmm. So he was a, a bicycle courier in the cold gold fields. And he was really, he, he really loved bicycles. Mm -hmm. In those days they were fixed wheel. Mm -hmm. So you know, the, the pedals just kept going around and around. So the first he went, I didn't have to lift your feet off. <laughs> But uh, a very, very interesting old man. He built his own property and it was all built out of second hand uh, corrugated iron. Oh, oh, yeah. uh, just amazing. I mean, you know, stuff like that would never get to the house. No, no, no. But yeah, remarkable character yeah. of those goldfield days. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I said, I'm sure most of you would be talking to have stories of people who lived there or other lives, as Sue said. We've only been here a fraction of those years, but the fascinating story you picked up on the time we've been around. Other than that, thank you very much for coming out on the cold night. We look forward to seeing you on a future meeting. Thank you and good night.